Here we go. All right. So welcome to Growing Down Podcast. This is episode eight already. And we are joined today and we are honored to be joined by Dr. Delman Coates. Welcome, Dr. Delman. And uh, I'm just going to do a quick introduction for you. Um, so Dr. Uh, Dr. Coates has served as the senior pastor of uh, Mount Ennin Baptist Church in Clinton, Maryland for over 16 years. And under his leadership, the church has been recognized as one of the fastest growing congregations in the country. And if I'm correct in this number, now has over 15,000 members. Uh, Delman is the founder of our Our Money ca campaign, and he has published several articles that have also been featured on a number of news outlets such as MSNBC, CNN, Fox News, VH1, and the New York Times. Um, Delman, also, you have a PhD in the New Testament and early Christianity from Columbia University, as well as a Master of Philosophy and Religion from Columbia and a Master of Divinity from Harvard Divinity School. So I just want to welcome you. It is an honor to have you here with us, and we're very excited to get into these questions connecting economic progressivism with spirituality. Um, this is just the topic that has come up again and again, so an honor to have you here. I'm delighted uh, to be with you and, and to your audience today, uh, Jeremy, Matt, and Ryan. Thank you so much. I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge, given our topic today, I'd be remiss if I did not acknowledge uh, that I'm an alum of Morehouse College. Um, Morehouse is that great institution that produced the likes of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And since we're talking about the intersection of spirituality and sort of a progressive economics, I'd be remiss without talking about, you know, the man that I regard as America's 20th century prophet, who was very much committed to uh, connecting the social gospel uh, that was really prominent in the first half of the 20th century with the range of social and economic challenges that were facing our country and facing um, uh, African Americans in particular. So uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge my alma mater, Morehouse College, uh, in that, uh, in that uh, reference as well. But thanks for having me on. Awesome. That's a wonderful right. plug. <laughs> so to get started, maybe we can, um, uh, where to begin? We, maybe we can begin with some of your work with the economic justice campaign. Um, you know, we were listening to a few background podcasts just to learn more about you. And you, in some of your interviews, were speaking about 2007, 2008 bailout. And well, here we are, you know, in the middle of not only a global pandemic, but also an economic crisis that in some ways is, is, is just exponentially worse in terms of the, the possible fallout in, um, in uh, you know, the needs of, of everyday working class people. So uh, maybe we can kind of explore that and how that got started and some of your background in, in bringing together economic progressivism and, and spirituality. Right. Well, you know, for African Americans and for working class people, economic crises are cyclical. They, you know, we have seen them in our lifetime um, uh, in, in very short intervals. Uh, in my own life and in my recent work as a pastor in Clinton, Maryland, um, my current work around monetary and fiscal policy began as I observed the collateral impact of the global financial crisis on the community in which I serve. Our congregation provides emergency assistance for families that are being foreclosed on or rental assistance for families that are being evicted. And I saw a major uptick in the number of co uh, members coming to the church for foreclosure assistance and emergency assistance around 2007, 2008. And it started me on this um, journey to really understand um, um, not, uh, not just the uh, symptoms related to the global financial crisis, and we know the range of symptoms, but I really wanted to understand the cause. It seemed uh, I was deeply disturbed about the way in which financial institutions that caused the crisis were getting bailed out and members of my church were getting put out of their homes. Repeatedly, I would attend um, foreclosure remediation events. I would hold foreclosure remediation events at my church, and I was dissatisfied with the response that I would hear from bankers, namely that the crisis was caused by people who took out 
loans uh, that they couldn't afford to pay back or that people were flipping houses. This narrative just didn't make sense to me. And the more that I got into understanding collateralized debt obligations, you know, mortgage securitization, it ultimately led me to want to understand more and more about the banking system and ultimately issues related to fiscal policy. And I, and, and I deeply believe now that the root cause of the range of social and economic challenges facing our country, and they are many, has a lot to do with our imprudent reliance on money created by the financial sector through bank lending rather than relying on a money supply created by the federal government through public spending. And it has ultimately led me to become um, an evangelist and a, an apostle for modern monetary theory, um, which is, uh, as you perhaps know, is a school of economic thought that's really been around for about three decades now, um, that's really about describing the economy for people who are concerned about uh, having a just and a sustainable economy that works for us rather than an economy that works against us. It, it resulted a, a few years ago in the launch of the Our Money campaign. Uh, folks can find out information about our campaign by going to our website, OurMoneyUS.org. It's a nonpartisan campaign where we are, it's a grassroots and a grass tops campaign in which I'm literally, and we're literally going around the country training thought leaders, influencers, faith leaders, civil rights leaders around the core economic tenets of modern monetary theory so that we can push for policies uh, that benefit the public. Um, and I'm really excited about this work. I really feel that our work um, is being vindicated when one sees the way in which we just saw it right before our eyes the federal government create almost $3 trillion in these three to four stimulus packages without relying on taxing, you know, Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, or Warren Buffett in order to fund this robust spending. We've also seen the New York Times recently did an article, I uh, believe around uh, April 26 in the, New in the New York Times. It was entitled how the federal government, you know, created all this money out of thin air, out of nothing. And just yesterday, CNBC did an article uh, on uh, MMT and it really kind of closed by saying we are all MMTers now. I believe that MMT really provides that kind of intersectional link um, for, for progressive people of faith who have been interested in economic justice and economic equal equality, concerned about poverty, but have really not had a language for thinking outside of the austerity paradigm that we have inherited, a paradigm that has presumed that it is economically irresponsible for the federal government to spend without borrowing or to spend without some source of revenue. That kind of logic is common sense. People understand it because that's how their households operate. It's how our businesses work, that you need revenue first in order to spend. And so for years, even progressive leaders of faith have operated within the very paradigm that has been to our detriment and to our demise. And I think that MMT has provided, has provided for me and for many other faith leaders and civil rights leaders that we're beginning to work with for really getting outside of this, this framework that implies that the public priorities of the poor, that the priorities of the public um, have to be held hostage to whether we tax multimillionaires and billionaires. Like why should healthcare for me and quality schools in the community where I serve be held hostage to whether we tax millionaires or not? That does not mean that there's not a role for taxation and MMT helps us to understand that there is a role for taxation and taxing the rich. But the federal government does not need to tax the rich in order to spend. And that really is a game changer for the public. It's a game changer in a variety of ways, particularly when one thinks about the way in which the American people have been pitted against one another. 
based on race, class, class, country of origin, sexual orientation, and a range of other discourses of difference. We have been pitted against one another, I believe, because of this economic framework that in many ways is predicated upon the notion that resources are scarce and that money is somehow scarce. But when one understands um, the operative logic of MMT, we realize that there are really no fiscal constraints. There are no fiscal policy constraints other than inflation that prevent us from creating all of the money we need to address our greatest social and economic challenges today. And so my journey began as a clergy leader, as a pastor, wrestling with families literally having all of their, so many families having their belongings left out on the street, being put out and really just trying to understand how this could happen in America. Yeah, really, really beautifully said. And I've watched a lot of uh, videos and looked up MMT and I feel like your articulation of it is probably the best I've heard. It's so easy to follow your, your train of thought. So I appreciate such a, a lucid uh, articulation of it. Um, I'm wondering if you can give an example of how you weave together MMT and economics into your ministry work. And, you know, my mom is a Buddhist minister. And so I have some familiarity with, you know, how congregations work and that kind of thing. But I think some, some people will start thinking about economics, you know, the dismal science, right? And, and, some, and it can be associated as something very different from religion and, you know, Christianity and spirituality. So I was kind of wondering if you could paint a picture of how you weave those two worlds together. Wow, there's so many. Um, you know, the foundational, what we really fail to realize is that when one explores much of the theological language in my faith tradition, which is Christianity related to sin, in many ways, historically, these theological categories have an economic origin. For example, take the Lord's Prayer, where there's a later elaboration of the Lord's Prayer that says, uh, forgive us our, our trespasses, forgive us our sins or something. Well, the sort of earliest tradition of the Lord's Prayer says, forgive us our debts, right? And um, so in many, and when one considers many of the preachments uh, that are found in both the Hebrew Bible or what Christians, some Christians call the Old Testament and in the New Testament, there are largely um, admonitions around issues of economics. Um, and we know that the major Abrahamic religions of the world, uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam had a historic position against usury as sin. Now, Islamic economics still regards usury or riba in Arabic as sin, as, as, as sin. Um, but when one understands the historic definition of usury, it is not, usury is not charging excessive interests as the Venetian bankers convinced the church to define usury around the 15th or 16th century. Usury is the unjust manipulation of money and the charging of interest on that which did not exist before, right? That's how Aquinas defined usury. Think about this. Usury is the charging of interest on that which did not exist before. It's based on this Aristotelian view that money should not be able to beget itself, that humans are self-begetting, Animals are, but a piece of paper should be able to multiply itself just for being. Well, what could be more usurious in an economy where banks can create the medium of exchange out of nothing and earn, ex, you know, and, and can earn, you know, an exponential amount of profit off of digits typed into a computer, right? Um, and you know, so 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 for me, I try to ground people's understanding that the language that we use about God is not so mystical and abstract as we're inclined to think, but it is very much rooted in how people live in the world today. Think about the tension between Cain and Abel, right? 
One was a sedentary farmer uh, and one was a herding shepherd. The whole story is about the, ten the agricultural and economic tensions between people who farm the land and those who were, you know, uh, agricultural, who were, who were herders and uh, things, of, uh, things of this nature. Um, there are so many different ways. In the Christian tradition, we just observed Christmas. In the, in the day before Jesus is charged, he goes into the temple and he throws out the money changers. What were the money changers doing? Well, the money changers were charging people interest to get the shekel, the, 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 the Hebrew shekel, the temple shekel that was necessary in order to worship in the temple. The shekel was a worthless coin. It was like when one looks at the minerals that it was like made of and the elements, it was, it was really like a worthless piece of, it was worthless, right? But the temple priests developed an alliance with the money changers to charge people for something that was literally worthless. People end up leaving Passover in more debt and in more economic bondage than when they came. And Jesus regarded this as an injustice. Ryan, let me say lastly that in a sermon that I recently did, maybe a year and a half ago, I talked about the way in which when banks create money, when they make loans, what they put in circulation is the amount of money borrowed, but not the amount of money owed, right? They put in circulation the principal amount of money, but not the interest portion of money. And I have spent a long period of time developing a range of conceptual metaphors to help people to understand that how that kind of arrangement makes our economy a lot like musical chairs. So that's a lot of what I do, because a lot of this stuff about MNT and economics and the Fed and all this stuff, you know, I mean, people like Warren Mosler and Stephanie Kelton and Andres Bernal and Rowan Gray, I mean, these guys are super smart, like they're super intelligent. So I have to really work to figure out how can I develop a conceptual frame and metaphor so that the brother on the street corner in Prince George's County, Maryland, Southeast DC or East Baltimore can understand it. And what they get are concepts like musical chairs, where there's not enough chairs, hence resources for the number of people in the game, right? And when I walk through the way in which an economy that, uh, that relies unnecessarily on money created through lending rather than public spending makes our economy a lot like musical chairs, where some people are gonna lose, not because they're lazy, not because they don't pray hard enough, not because there's not enough charity, you know, not because they don't have enough education, but because they've been forced to exist in an economic arrangement predicated on structural scarcity in the money supply. And when I talk about that and help people to understand that the solution is to not tell the people who don't get a chair to be more like those who do, hence lift up the ideal black person who succeeded, you know, like, oh, look at Dr. Coates. He has three degrees. You guys should be like him. Look at Barack Obama. Look at Oprah Winfrey. Look at Jay-Z and Beyonce. If we just aspire to these success models, we'll be fine. No, what we have to do is put more chairs on the table. And what MMT is about making sure that we have an economy predicated on sufficient economic resources rather than insufficient economic resources as our current arrangement is. That's an excellent description. Thank you. Uh, one of my questions that I had um, is how, how are you, I know you've talked in the, again, in previous podcasts, and you sort of mentioned it too with Dr. King's uh, social gospel. I know you've talked a little bit about sort of some work he left unfinished about economic justice. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you see your role in furthering Dr. King's message? Right. Thank you for that. Well, we know that the unfinished work of the civil rights movement is the work of economic justice and that Dr. King died fighting for the rights of sanitation workers. 
I think the greatest travesty to his legacy is the way in which we have edited out of the I have a dream speech the portion that I think I'm not going to say it's the most important because certainly certainly the lofty rhetoric is important about racial unity and equality but there's a portion of that of that legacy in that speech that he left to us that we totally leave out the, the notion about um um, people getting a check marked insufficient funds. Um, rhetoric where he is talking about, um, um, if one thinks about his final speech on April the 3rd, 1968, the most important part of that, um, I've been to the mountaintop speech, is the middle portion where he talks about we need an insurance in, a bank in, take go down to the banks and take all of your money out, which which shows this sort of evolving appreciation and understanding of the role of economics when it comes to politics um, in, 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 um, in our society today. And, um, and we don't know, unfortunately, because his life was taken away from him too soon, how the evolution of his ideas may have, how they may have uh, evolved. But what we do know is that central to the civil rights movement's goal for economic justice, and this is really a part of my, my interest in work, is the whole fight for a federal job guarantee, right? The federal job guarantee is first proposed by an African-American economist. She's the nation's first Black, the first African-American economist in the 40s, a woman by the name of Sadie Alexander, and uh, the, uh, Professor Nina Banks, uh, has been doing some great work on Nina Alec on uh, uh, Sadie Alexander. She's an African American uh, nation's first black economist in the 40s, and she's talking about an important tool to help African Americans buffer some of the racial tensions and backlash they were getting uh, during that time. Was they need to have a right to a job, a dignified job with benefits. Um, so that so that so that whites rather than whites could get out of this environment where they feel like blacks are taking their jobs that what we needed is the federal government to pick up the slack in our economy and provide have, have a policy solution to um provide a dignified job with benefits for every american that wanted one and the civil rights movement was really about continuing that legacy the march on washington was not a march about racial unit harmony exclusively. If you think of, if most people just think about the closing moments of King's speech, they think that it was just about people of all races, you know, joining, you know, joining hands together. No, it was a march on Washington for jobs and freedom. That was the official name of the march, the march on Washington for jobs and freedom. And they were fighting for policy solutions that led to uh, a dignified job with benefits for every person that want, wanted one. They used the language, you know, one man, you know, one man, one job, things of this nature. Coretta Scott King continued that legacy in the 70s. She led 1.2 million people in rallies and marches around the country fighting for a federal job guarantee. And it was her campaign that ultimately led to the Humphrey Hawkins Act and the dual mandate of the Federal Reserve, which, which is a compromise of the uh, quest for a federal job guarantee or the goal of full employment. Like that's the goal of a federal job guarantee to get us to full employment. And we know that the dual mandate of the Fed falls short of getting us uh, to that for a variety of reasons, managing, uh, interest rate policy on the back of the poor and stuff like that. So I have really felt as a, an African American pastor committed to the social justice tradition of the black church. And let me say this, I define the black church as that subset of African American Christianity that has been on the side of the fight for freedom, justice, and equality. I say that because in my view, there's a difference between the black church and the church of blacks. Every church 
of African Americans may or may not be committed to that freedom fighting tradition. But I explicitly regard myself as someone who is committed to that freedom fighting tradition. And, and, and the civil rights movement, the civil rights movement's goal of fighting for economic justice and a federal job guarantee is something that I'm deeply passionate about. Because when one looks at unemployment statistics, African Americans are disproportionately represented in those who are unemployed. That whenever the Fed is raising interest rates because it fears that unemployment is getting too low and uh, for fear of inflation and the Phillips curve, which we know is like, is really a problematic framework that we're gonna now raise interest rates that is black people, it's brown people, the poor who are the casualties of that kind of policy, uh, uh, those kind of policy decisions. Those are the kind of people that I serve. Those are the kind of people that I have to pray for. Uh, those are the individuals that I have to recommend for a range of remedial services and social programs. And so I'm committed to public policy solutions at a macroeconomic level uh, to end that. And so I'm very much interested in committing my voice, my ministry to furthering the work of a man who is like my hero. Like I went to Morehouse because of Dr. King, you know, I, I, I wanted to go to Morehouse as a 14, 15 year old and who, you know, around 16, 17 knew I wanted to go into ministry because of Dr. King. And um, my whole heart is about how we make the world a better place for all people. I also believe that MMT, and you all stop me if I'm over talking this, like if I was on some other programs, feel free to, to, to stop me. <laughs> but I also believe that MMT provides an important framework to help us address the race problem in America. Because I believe that to a large degree, a factor that has played a role in the racial tensions that we have experienced in America and historically around the world, when one has a monetary interpretation of history, has, to do, has a lot to do with notions of scarcity of resources. I mean, think for example, when the world's economy was based on, the gold, on gold, right? In the, I don't know, 1500s, 1400s, stuff like that. Well, if money is gold, right? Um, and you're the queen of Spain, you're the king of Portugal and stuff like that. There's no gold there, right? So how can you be a player on the world's economic stage if you don't have gold? Well, I guess we have to go get it. So we have to put some guys on some ships and send them over to South America, you know, and, uh, dis and discover it, right? Um, and mine it. And after the original people there are die because of the diseases that are brought there or for whatever reasons we bring folks from Africa there. I, I believe that uh, if when one has a monetary interpretation of history that, that this notion that money is scarce plays a large role in how people fight and compete for what they perceive to be scarce economic resources. Again, going back to the musical chairs meta uh, analogy. I have, dem you asked Ryan, how do I con dem demonstrate this for people? I have done demonstrations at my church where I have put 10 people on a stage with 10 chairs. And I've said, I want you all to walk around these chairs. And when the music stops, whoever gets a chair, I'll give you $100. 10 chairs for 10 people. And they will walk around those chairs. Everything will be pleasant. They'll smile. It's, very, it's a great situation. And when the music stops, they help one another to sit down. The young people help the elderly ones to sit down. Great environment. I ask them to stand back up and I remove four chairs. And I say, now I want you all to walk around these chairs. And when the music stops, Whoever gets a chair, I'll give you $100. Same people, same race, same religion. What's different? The context in which they're forced to exist. Now, while they're walking around the chairs, you feel this tension. You feel this sense of anxiety. 
Um, there's a great deal of suspicion. And when the music stops, they push, they shove, they form alliances. Why did that happen? It didn't necessarily happen because they're now inherent, something happened to their character. It happened because of their context. And I believe that we can help buffer. We can help address many of the racial issues that we have experienced in our society by changing the way we think about money. The tagline of the Our Money campaign, and again, our website is OurMoneyUS.org, is change money, change the world. Where I say in my tagline, if we change the way we think about money, we can literally change the world. We can literally change the world if we realize that we have the fiscal policy space to provide Medicare for all, to provide a federal job guarantee, to provide greater federal investments in local and state priorities, a Green New Deal, abolition of student loan debt, free public college, whatever. How do we pay for it? Well, we don't have to tax people who make over $250,000 a year for it. We're not, we don't have to take your tax money to pay for their priorities. Uh, Camille Walsh has a great book out. I think it's called Racialized Taxation or Racial Taxation that if you haven't read, you really want to read. We fund it by utilizing the power of the public purse to address our social challenges. And I think that in doing so, it makes this need to feel like Black folks are taking my job my job, that brown folks are taking my job, uh, that my tax money is going to pay for their, you know, their, their schools, for their health care. It takes us out of this sort of framework and rhetoric that we have been forced to exist in, in an environment that is, that I believe derives from a time when our money is on uh, the goal, you know, on the gold standard. Again, I'm a preacher. I'm not an economist. You know, you, you have to have some folks who are, you know, brighter than 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 me to to answer this. But I think that this is a critical moment because um, we are in an environment that's palpable for demagogues to exploit these conditions and to scapegoat people and to pit people against one another. And we've seen that. So this is just not about providing an economic vision for our country. It's about providing a social vision for our country where we can pursue common ground by emphasizing what we share in common rather than accenting what distinguishes us. Beautifully said. Um, uh, maybe we can, we can uh right on that theme uh, with something that you said that really inspired me in a previous interview. And you said something along the lines that this is fundamentally about communal salvation, right? That the redemption of society and of the individual have to go together, right? It's not just about my personal spiritual liberation. It's about the liberation of the community, right? The communitas. So maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Thank you for that, Jeremy. Um, well, <clears throat> one of the things that I attempt to do to help people see the connection between spirituality and economics, once again, is to ground our understanding of theology and some understanding of sociology. The biblical word from my tradition in the Hebrew Bible, tikkun olam, is about, which can be translated salvation, is about a holistic view of salvation for the community. It's not just about the redemption of one's individual souls destined for heaven after we die. It is about the redemption or salvation of the bodies which, within which those souls live in the here and now. That's my understanding of the biblical notion of salvation in the Old Testament or in the Hebrew Bible. Um, and I think that's critically important. It's, it's especially important for me as an African-American because when one goes to the slave castles in West Africa, there is this vivid image when you go to the Elmina Castle in Ghana 
where you go down into these slave dungeons and you can almost still smell the stench of bodies. Um, it's, it's, I can't describe the experience when you go there. But when you emerge from the uh, slave dungeons, right above the slave dungeon is a church, a chapel. It's mind blowing that people had the capacity to worship God upstairs and to enslave humans in the basement, downstairs, in the dungeon. And so there is in the, in the history of, you know, Western theology, a separation of the body and the spirit, you know, based on the sort of platonic dualism, you, you know, it doesn't matter what we do with the bodies of these people, they're not human. As long as we Christianize them and baptize them, we can rest assured that they're going to heaven after they die. It doesn't really matter what we do to their bodies while, while they're alive. And so as an African-American per person of faith, it is very important that, that we uh, embrace a kind of African Eastern cosmology that brings together the body, mind, and spirit and integrate that with an understanding of our sociology and economics that says we have to care about the whole person. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's like, it's like this rhetoric that I hear from some perhaps sincere yet, I think misled Christians who talk about pro-life. When you look at their policy proposals, they're really not pro-life, they're pro-birth. Because after the child is born, they're against all policies that would help the child have a good life. You know, they're against investments in pre-K, against, you know, providing great quality public education, health care, a, a livable wage for their parents. That's not pro-life. You guys are really just pro-birth. But when one has a holistic spirituality, one, you know, definitely sees the intersection between these range of discourses. So we have to have a kind of interdisciplinary, intersectional spirituality, one that sees the connection between, um, you know, these various disciplines, you know, you know, the social sciences, you know, economics, politics, it's all deeply connected and related. And, and sometimes I have to work because, because there is a strain of American Christian religious expression, which is also prominent in some African American congregations, that is thoroughly otherworldly. Um, think about when you think about the fact that Dr. King was kicked out of the National Baptist Convention, right? Because they said that his work was like too radical, it was unnecessary, he was rocking the boat, he was kicked out of you know the largest body of religious body of African-American Christians in the country. And they left and formed the Progressive National Baptist Convention. That's because, you know, there was this struggle between really seeing, you know, what's the point of all this, you know, fighting and marching and trying to get, you know, good benefits. You know, when Jesus is coming back tomorrow, right? He's coming back anytime, right? <laughs> yeah, so, um, uh, so, so I, I really, you know, we have to work on, on a variety of, of planes to do what your podcast is designed to do. People are accustomed to living in their own ideological silos, in their own sort of, sort of ideological ghettos, for lack of a better term, right? Um, where we sort of bifurcate life and reality. But what you all are trying to do is to help people see the way in which it's all interwoven, it's all connected. And uh, that, is a, uh, that is a huge Herculean task. And so I actually commend, you know, uh, what, what you all are doing because it's one thing for something to be appealing to the mind. 
It's another thing to go out on the streets or on cyberspace and persuade the public that we, 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 we don't live in these separate spheres. We have to figure out how to have a more integrative approach to life and living. That was a better description of integral theory than we gave at the beginning. Yes. Um, we were trying to explain to you. <laughs> so yeah, goosebumps, man. Just uh, incredible. I'm I'm kind of wondering if you can, if we can get really specific here for a moment. And you, I think you've painted a beautiful picture of the power of the MMT framework as a kind of galvanizing force for uh, socially inclined individuals and for the left in general. So let's take some some inner cities that are really struggling economically, that have endured um, uh, intergenerational poverty and, and a whole cornucopia of you know, oppressive uh, policies throughout the centuries. And if uh, this, the, specifically the jobs guarantee program backed by MMT was implemented in the way you're envisioning, I'm wondering if you can just give us a picture of how that community would be transformed on a economic, spiritual, moral, social level. And what are some of the specific jobs that you are envisioning that should be created by uh, the public sphere? Yeah. Well, the community that comes to mind is East Baltimore and Baltimore City. But this really can be replicated in any major city in America. But what, what sort of comes to mind are certain sections of the city of Baltimore where um, there's been the, you know, abject divestment, underinvestment, non-investment in many of the uh, African-American communities there, low-income communities there that one can imagine. Um, what a, a federal job guarantee, um, you know, when people have a job, it gives them a sense of hope. It, it, it gives them a sense of meaning and value. When people don't have a stake in their community, when they don't have a stake in, well, they, when they feel they don't have a stake in their community, when they feel that they don't have a stake in society, um, it leads to people engaging in a range of behaviors just to survive. And it can lead into people getting involved into a range of self-destructive behavior where they don't care about themselves and they definitely don't care about someone else. So I think that a federal job guarantee, and I think more importantly, what a federal job guarantee does is it, it eliminates the notion where we tend to blame the victims in society. See, what we tend to do is, see, if you don't have a job, and if you didn't get an education, you know, and uh, it must be something you're doing wrong. It must, you must, you know, um, if you don't have a job, you're not hustling. You know, you hear a lot of people saying, uh, you know, I'm going to hustle. I'm going to get, you know, you have, to, you have to learn how to hustle. And there are a range of myths about poverty and inequality in our society that, may, that's, that, that seem to make sense on a common sense level, but they're just wrong at a macroeconomic level. There's an awesome uh, publication by Dr. William Sandy Darity out of Duke University. So Dr. Darity... Uh, did a piece along with a range of other economists, Derek Hamilton, it's called the 10 Myths of the Racial Wealth Gap. And these 10 myths are very prominent, if not in, in society, among conservatives, but definitely among African Americans. So like if you're in the situation that you're in, it's because you didn't, uh, you didn't work hard. You didn't, uh, it, it's just something about your, your moral, you know, there's something wrong with you morally. Maybe you didn't pray hard enough. You don't have enough faith. Um, you know, notions about your educational status. And, but what ends up happening is we end up blaming the victims of society for their problems. And I think that a federal job guarantee would relieve this kind of burden that, that people, uh, that has been imposed unfairly on people uh, by implying that their condi the condition that they're in is their fault and it's because they don't want to work hard. I, I believe that the laziest people and in institution or industry in America is the banking industry. I mean, you talk about people receiving welfare. 
You talk about an industry that receives subsidies in billions and hundreds of billions and trillions of dollars on a regular basis. We're talking about banks. Like these guys do not work for the money that they receive. They, they, you know, they scam the rest of us. They have convinced us that we need to rely on their credit in order to have an economy. But so it's just misplaced, a misplaced burden. And I think that a federal job guarantee would relieve that kind of misplaced burden. That people really carry this sense that, oh, I'm poor, I'm struggling because I didn't do something that Delman did or I didn't do something that Barack Obama or Beyonce or Oprah Winfrey did. It's, it's like my fault. And whenever people are forced to exist in an economy predicated on scarcity, like that musical chairs, if they don't get a chair, it's not their fault. And I think a federal job guarantee can go a long way towards removing that kind of psychic burden that is oppressing people at our levels. And, and the jobs that I, that I imagine in a federal job guarantee are limitless. I don't think that a federal job guarantee just has to provide entry level or, or entry level you know, jobs. I mean, a federal job guarantee, if we have a broad understanding of what a federal job guarantee can do, there's no reason we can't pay doctors, engineers, you know, artists, you know, because we need the arts, right? Um, you know, Architect, there are all kinds of jobs we can imagine if the federal government understood the power of the public purse to, um, uh, uh, to address public priorities. It's critical that we have a federal job guarantee because first, it will, um, it will provide a floor to wages. I mean, I have people all the time and I say to people all the time, have you ever gone to your boss to ask for a raise? Everyone nods, right? And I say, well, what incentive is there for your, to, for your boss to increase your pay from $10 to $20 an hour if there's a whole pool of unemployed people who will take $8 an hour? I, I just saw that the unemployment rolls, we had 30 million people now apply for unemployment in just the last four or five weeks. What incentive is there for the private sector to increase people's wages if there's a whole population and pool of unemployed people out there who will take $9 an hour. So we need a federal job guarantee to provide a floor to wages to take that slack uh, out of the economy. And we need a federal job guarantee to end involuntary unemployment in America. And I see no reason why the, the, a federal job guarantee, why policies like healthcare, like Medicare for all, can't provide quality jobs quality health care in the same way that the private sector can. And how we have done it in the past does not have to provide the model for providing these public services in the future. With more robust spending and investments in them, public hospitals, public health care, you know, public jobs, um, I think, uh, you know, the, 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 the sky's the limit. And I think one of the greatest models for this is the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. Because there are a lot of federal government workers and employees in this area. And they're doing really well, even in a pandemic. Doesn't mean that some people aren't getting laid off. You know, it doesn't mean some people aren't getting laid, uh, being furloughed, but it's providing a buffer in this area in ways that other areas don't have that buffer, where restaurants are closing and letting people off, where bars and lounges and businesses are closing people off. There's no time like, like, not like this one for a federal job guarantee. And the stimulus packages that we've just seen have been more stimuli, L-I-E. These, these have been a stimuli, not stimulus. We have not been stimulated as a result of these programs. I mean, we need, I mean, $1, a $1,200 check is not going to be sufficient. We need robust policy solutions that are going to get us, uh, that, 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 that people can rely on for the long term, long term and not these temporary short-term uh, 
fixes here. So a federal job guarantee can provide all kinds of meaningful, quality jobs at every level. And not only that, it would happen at a time if we envision a new economy when people's private debt levels would not be so high. See, when we rely on more public spending, we're relying less on private, private lending, right? Right now, the average family, the average person works 40 to 50 hours a week, Ryan, to pay interest on borrowed money, on a mortgage, school loan, a car note, and department store credit cards, right? Like, I don't know, probably 80% of your paycheck on Friday is going to pay interest on, a bor on, on borrowed money. Well, if we shift our relationship from money put in circulation based on public spending rather than private lending, okay, it's not just that I would get a job, a guaranteed job in healthcare, but I'm also not, I'm, uh, the, 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 the benefit of my labor and my wages is not going out of the door to the financial sector to pay interest on borrowed money. That's a huge benefit. <clears throat> For the, American, for the American people, um, for, for the public. And so for me, MMT is about democratizing our money system, democratizing in our economy in a way that, that, that ensures that we have an economy that works for the people rather than against them. Awesome. One of the questions I have, it's an election year, and there seems to be a fracture in the progressive party between corporate Democrats and maybe so a lot of these ideas you're promoting, the Green New Deal, Medicare for all, I won't name specific candidates, but what is your opinion on maybe why that narrative isn't yeah. becoming more popular? Yeah. Well, the reason I'm committed to the Our Money campaign is because I've decided not to, and it's hard, I've decided not to malign people but to address the principles that inform their logic. And when I listen to candidates discuss uh, their policies, I think it's because they're relying on false fiscal policy assumptions. Most people think that the federal government's ability to spend is like a home. It's, it's common sense that you need revenue first in order to spend, that makes sense. It's, it's common sense reasoning that if my business needs revenue in order to spend, if my home needs revenue first in order to spend, if my state and my county the same, it makes sense that the federal government needs revenue first in order to spend. So many well-intentioned people, I want to try to assume that they're well-intentioned, running for Congress, have this same logic. And so, and they assume that it's fiscally irresponsible to run deficits. And so all of their policy proposals are about how to minimize that deficit number and operate within this pay for framework. Think about the democratic uh, debates that we just saw. One candidate boasted that his healthcare proposal would just cost 785 billion over 10 years. He thought that was a good thing. And he condemned someone else's proposal for costing $30 trillion over 10 years. And he thought that that made his proposal sound. But when one understands the sector balances that are really, uh, that are really underneath the MMT framework, when the federal government is in deficit, we're in surplus. And that deficit spending doesn't cost us money, it creates money. This is what I help you. It doesn't cost us money to fund Medicare for all, single payer health care at $30 trillion over 10 years. It's going to create $30 trillion. You say create $30 trillion? Yes. When we pay for doctors and nurses, build hospitals, the construction workers to build the hospitals, you know, the people in the medical billing, I don't know, whatever. We don't probably don't even need those people. All of the jobs and nurses, is going to create 30 trillion when one understands deficit spending is 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 a positive when done responsibly not a negative it doesn't cost us 30 trillion dollars it creates 30 trillion dollars and that's what we want and so any anyone proposing a policy 
that underutilizes the full extent of the public purse to address public policies is really out there pushing us towards private sector solutions that allow private companies to profit off of our public needs. So we don't need universal health insurance. We need universal health care and proposals that underutilize the federal government's investment in that is really putting that onus on me as a private individual. Think, for example, why the federal government failed to respond adequately in response to the coronavirus. I mean, yeah, I mean, one of the problems is we kind of people kind of get up, get into the uh, their aversion to the personality of the person in the White House. And I get that. But underneath it is this notion, in my opinion, underneath it is this notion that the federal government cannot afford to pay all of the money that would have to, that would be required to buy math, to, to, to test every American. We couldn't possibly afford that. We couldn't possibly afford to buy PPEs for, you know, every hospital in every state and every city. We couldn't afford, it's the affordability question. So whenever the federal government is trafficking in the realm of, of austerity, then they put the responsibility on the states and the cities and on individuals. And presidents and candidates for national office are doing the same. So I think that what is distinguishing, you know, you say you don't want to name names, so I'm going to try to do this. Uh, candidate. You can a, name names. I was just trying to be politically. Candidate A from candidate B to candidate C, it really goes to this notion of what can we afford? And that's why I believe that MMT is so powerful because what I believe we need right now in America is a unifying meta narrative that links people who have heretofore seen themselves as different in different camps. Yeah, the corporate Democrats and the progressive Democrats are in these camps in my mind, not just because they're bad people, not because they're bad people, but because their flawed logic. Even think, even think about the logic that progressive Democrats use to support their policies. They all are looking for how to pay for it. Bernie is looking for how to pay for Medicare for all. Elizabeth looks for how to pay for her proposal. Everybody's looking for the money, right? And a liberal progressive Democrat will never be able to win as long as he or she continues to operate within that logic. It's, it's a failed and flawed logic because you're trying to, you're trying to promote robust spending proposals using an austerity framework. In my opinion, that can't work. Um, and, and, and not only that, it's not how the, it's not how the country actually works. If we go to war tomorrow, God forbid, we're not going to, we're not going to tax the millionaires and the quadrillionaires in order to pay for it. We're not. And yet those same senators will vote or support going to war. If we're threatened, we're not going to tax the multimillionaires and the billionaires to fund it. No, we just create it through deficit spending. We've created $15 trillion since, two, well, no more, 20 plus trillion dollars since 9-11 through deficit spending. It's not how the economy works. So I just believe that progressives have got to chunk and get rid of the pay for framework. We've got to get rid of PAYGO. We've got to get rid of the tax and spend framework where we've got to have a dollar in for every dollar out. And we've got to, in my mind, stop going around you know, operating within this logic, we need to work on a grassroots campaign and a grass tops campaign, but a grassroots campaign where the public is now understanding, wow, we have more power than we thought. I, I have been going around the country for the last 18 months doing trainings with black clergy around MNT and around the Our Money Campaign Framework. And during the month of March, I received so many texts, messages from clergy who saw what was happening with the stimulus packages and said, I get it now. 
I get it now. I understand. The government can just create the money when it deficit spends. They saw it. We all saw it right before our eyes. The wizard behind the curtain was exposed. And I don't believe that a progressive candidate can win operating within that framework. It's a commonsensical framework. You're operating within the same common sense framework that, that you know, conservatives and moderates are operating within. I just don't think we can, we, you know, a progressive can win with that. I, I think you have to give that up and, and, um, and use different, a different framework and different tools for that. That's just my Yeah, it's like it's like fighting in their territory, right? It's their rules, it's their game, it's about austerity, and it's an uphill battle whenever you start to argue for, oh, we'll 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 take a couple of pennies from um trading in the stock market or the ultra rich. It's always gonna be an uphill battle. And I, I watched that, we all watched that firsthand uh during these primaries, how difficult it was to counter that narrative on it on that narrative's own terms. So I think you're really onto something here about sort of reframing the whole, the whole territory. Um, How did David defeat Goliath? When, 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 when David was summoned to come out of the, to come out to go against Goliath, they initially gave him Goliath's weaponry and, and armor. Gave him his shield and all this stuff. He's like, oh, I can't use that. I'm just going to use this slingshot. And, and some stones. You have to use totally different, you have to use totally different framework, methods, tools, weapons, if we're gonna defeat this Goliath. It is a Goliath, but it makes sense to people. And you don't have to be an academic to get the core economic framework of MMT. I wanna tell you, people get it. If, if we work hard, to develop conceptual language and metaphors that people can grasp and understand. The average lay person on the street, they understand it. I think one of the best people who, who has a gift for condensing these terms and concepts in ways that are accessible to the public is Stephanie Kelton. Uh, she's really amazing. Um, and I'm really thankful for her, her research but her writing, it's so accessible. I'm working my way through an advanced copy of the deficit myth that she sent me. And if your audience has not pre-ordered it, really wanna encourage everyone to go out and pre-order the deficit myth uh, by Stephanie Kelton so that you can understand what MMT is all about. Oh, one of the things that you were saying, and I guess it changes the game a little bit if, and I just maybe your opinion on it. If maybe these people in power aren't just ideolog ideologically not on board with this, but maybe they are irresponsible. Maybe they are wanting to keep the power in the one percent's hands. How does that change the game if that's the case? Yeah. You mean the you mean the politicians? Yes. Yeah. Thank you for that. I have been saying in years as a result of my issue-based advocacy that members of Congress are not the leaders. Um, I just had, I just arranged for a private meeting with uh, U.S. Senators and members of the House. Um, it was a private off the record meeting. I want to make sure that I, it was a private off the record meeting with members of the U.S. Senate and members of the House of Representatives. Uh, it, it came after a long meeting I held last year with members of the congressional delegation in which I talked about the Our Money campaign and the MMT framework. And they said, hey, wow. That's interesting, but you're just a black preacher. Let us hear from someone who like really knows what they're talking about. And I said, okay. So I brought in Stephanie Kelton and Scott Fulweiler to this meeting. We just had a meeting in February. 
And I would, I would say that the folks in the room understood the economic framework of MMT. And they even said that. They get it. The problem is if they don't feel pressure from whoever supports them or donates to them, they're not gonna support. They're not gonna like, they're not leaders like that. They're not gonna just stand up and say, oh, we've been thinking about this incorrectly. I'm a tax and spend Democrat. I've been the tax and spend Democrat for years, you know? Um, so they have to, they have to be pushed. Um, and, and, you know, I commend, I commend, you know, the young uh, progressives like AOC and, you know, and Ayanna, Pre you know, the, the, the young voices, the women that we're seeing, Congresswoman Tlaib and others, I commend them, right? Um, at the same time, I understand that there's a, there's a pragmatic aspect to like being in politics, right? Like if you want to stay in your position, depending upon the demographics of your district and stuff like that. So what we have to do is, as we have a grass top strategy of meeting with members of Congress, meeting with uh, influencers, civil rights leaders, clergy leaders, we also have to have a grassroots strategy because if, if there's not a thousand people knocking at their door saying, Congressman X, Y, Z, we want you to support Medicare for all, federal, uh, 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 federal job guarantee, what, they're not gonna do it just because it makes sense. They're not. So, so we have to build that grassroots support as we are informing people at the top. So the power is in the people. It really is. The power is in the people. Um, um, the power is in the 99, in the 99%. And, um, and that's where our work is. We have, we, we, we have to work to change the minds of the people that, um, that, that cast the votes if, if we're gonna see this change. I, I, think, I think when I talk to members of Congress, they get it, they understand it. They say, you're right. You know, uh, the Democrats will say, you know, um, if there's anyone who understands MMT, it's the Republicans. That's what they say. They say, uh, Republicans, understand MMT. They just use it to spend money for the rich. And they, and they said that uh, the problem is the reason Democrats operate within the austerity framework is because being fiscally irresponsible was the attack that was used by Republicans for so many decades. So now, you know, we Democrats are operating and we're going to be fiscally responsible we're gonna have a pay-go budget rule, blah, 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 because we wanna show that we're not you know, fiscally uh, irresponsible. So to me, they get it. They understand it. You know, We just gotta figure out how to now show them that there's a pool of support for it. Uh, I'm now working on a national civil rights statement of support for public spending and fiscal policy wherein I'm going, where I'm working with national civil rights leaders talking about their support for more robust public spending, MMT, and the range of public policies that we discussed, and how the austerity framework is deeply harmful to the African-American community. So I'm literally working on that as we speak, and we'll be going around over the next few weeks um, shopping and I already have the buy-in from a leading civil rights uh, organization and leader now. I'm really excited about that. Um, we're working with leading African-American religious denominations supporting a policy position for FJG, Medicare for All, Green New Deal, da, da, da. And we are affirming that MMT provides a credible economic framework for thinking about how we fund these policies um, and that we are eschewing the economic stewardship of you know, the guys in the past in the 90s who led to you know, record unemployment, the housing collapse, et cetera, and benefiting Wall Street. So hopefully as we, as we build this public support you know, from the bottom, we can see some movement you know, and some shifts over time.
Well said. I, I wanted to ask, um, during this epidemic and during this, this uh, crisis, have you found that your congregation and then um, the communities that you're speaking to are more receptive to these ideas? Is there, is there an upswell of interest? Is there kind of a, a turning of uh, a viability for many of these ideas? Well, we've, we've held several ch trainings and workshops at our church around modern monetary theory and the future of economic justice. We walk through the core tenets of MMT. We talk about the policy proposals that, um, that could result from, you know, uh, the public really changing the way they think about monetary po uh, fiscal policy and money. And there's great interest, you know, like people get it. Um, what they need is leadership. What we need are leaders. Right. So our theory of change for the Our Money campaign is really focused on influencing the influencers. All right. So, so there's a tier of mid-level influencers or leaders, people, key clergy leaders, civil rights leaders, union leaders, you know, teachers unions, you know, steel workers, like labor union leaders, stuff like that. Um, who influence people below them, grassroots folks, but they also are a voice to people, you know, at the top. So we're really just, I'm really working on influencing the influencers because, you know, to some degree, when I work, when I meet with, you know, the average lay person in my congregation, they get it. They're like, wow, we're ready to revolution. Uh, we had a major march in support of a federal job guarantee on Labor Day. A thousand or so people came out, we marched, you know, it was something I did spur of the moment, members of my church in the area, a few local pastors. Um, we marched, we met at the King Memorial. We marched to the Federal Reserve Building. We had speakers, Andres, uh, uh, you know, several of the Modern Monetary Network guys came down, local activists from different campaigns spoke. People get it, right? They're just looking for, you know, direction and leadership. I serve as a leader, you know, of one congregation, and all I can do is to try to socialize these ideas with other leaders and influencers so that hopefully, you know, together, you know, we can then go to the Democratic Party and say, you know, look, here's our resolution. Here's our 10 asks right now. See, right now, the problem, I want to say in the African-American community, is that we don't have a specific policy agenda. We just have a set of general issues that we're affected by. You know, uh, education. Like if you go to meetings, I just be like, education. Well, what the, what is that? Like, what's the policy you want? Uh, housing, you know, affordable housing. Okay, that's a issue. That's not a policy. You know, uh, unemployment. Okay, yeah. Okay, but what's the policy? We don't have a specific set of policies to put on the table for candidates for office. So what happens is people come to African-Americans to court our vote. Um, but those particular, the, those candidates really have no commitment Did we, uh, yeah, I think we, we, we don't because oh, we don't have it. And that's what, and that's what, uh, you know, we're about to do. And I'm committed to that. Mm -hmm. We lost you there for just a moment at the end, but I think, yeah. I think we, we get the message, right. That, that this is going to require, um, so much of a, as you said, influencing the influencers, there's, there's a kind of a horizontal, um, coalition building that needs to take place here to really kind of help direct this and and bring leadership to something that could have a lot of public attention and energy and enthusiasm and support uh, towards better legislation. So um, I just want to say that's that's fantastic. I'm very inspired by what you're doing. And it's just so important. So thank you. So for excited, your... guys. Like, I'm really excited. Like, I'm super excited. Um, you know, it's going to take time. Um, but 
you know, I'm a person of faith and I just believe that, you know, people are coming together. We now have the framework to unite us. We now have the framework to bring us together because heretofore, I would say progressives have been a fragmented fellowship where, you know, you have environmentalists over here, you have LGBT activists over here, Black Lives Matter activists over here, labor, mass incarceration. You know, we've been sort of like a fragmented fellowship. No movement can succeed that way. No, no movement can succeed without a unifying core. It's not, you know. And I think that modern monetary theory provides that kind of unifying core because it answers the one question <laughs> that at the end of the day is raised to all of the groups based on their particular issue. And that's how in the heck are we going to pay for all of this stuff? That's what the politician wants to know. That's what the public is trying to figure out how you're going to pay for it. So that pay for question is, I think, an important piece that can unify. It provides that unifying link because now, you know, if, 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 now, if, if I'm a person and my passion is about universal pre-K, I don't have to come to the table and say, well, can you, can you give up some of your budget money? Can you give up some money for your program so that I can have some money? And then we're all sitting here pulling and shoving and debating off of this limited pie. The pie is not limited. See, what MMT tells us, I tell people, what MMB, MMT teaches us is that our parents lied to us when we were kids. You know, when you went to your kid and you said, oh, I want a new Atari 2600. Okay, you guys are too young. You don't remember Atari 2600. So <laughs> you went no, to your parents. I right, remember you that. Like, oh, Atari 2600, what was that? <laughs> That was funny. So, you know, when you were a kid and you wanted the new, I don't know, Nintendo or whatever the game station, Ryan, that you had when you were a kid, you, went, you wanted the new shoes, you wanted the new gaming system, you know, you wanted to, you wanted the new dirt bike or motorcycle. Your parents said, what do you think? You think money grows on trees? MMT teaches us that money really does grow on trees. Just let that sink in. As a matter of fact, money, growing money is actually easier than growing a tree, planting a tree. Because if you planted a tree, you would have to wait for it to grow. Money is just a digital entry into a computer. It's easier than growing a tree. And so we have all of the money we need to pay for universal pre-K, uh, disability leave, whatever you want, you, you, you can imagine. It's affordable. And so that's why I think that MMT is so key for us going forward, because whether you're concerned about the environment, education, mass transit, you know, mass incarceration, whatever, it's all going to be linked to this resource, how we're going to pay for it dynamic. And, and so I'm really hopeful and I'm really excited about the period that we're in. And I also want to say that I think that this divide between conservative, moderate, and progressive can be ameliorated in this environment as well, to a large extent. There are always going to be people on the fringes who are like ideological and like dogmatic, right, about stuff. But I think that there are well-intentioned people in the movable middle well-intentioned, you know, people who may define themselves as fiscal conservative. I mean, think about John Yarmouth, who is the chair of the budget committee, House Budget Committee, and all of these quote unquote conservatives who have been saying like recently, like, you know what? MM, I think we need to give more thought to MMT. Um, I am not promoting this person at all. I want to be clear about that. But even Steve Bannon, not a couple of weeks ago, was like, I think we need to rethink MMT. You know, John Yarmouth, people who have, you know, heretofore, um, you know, the Fed guys like saying things like the Phillips curve is not what we thought it was. Everything that MMT has been saying is really being vindicated in the financial media and with a range of people who have heretofore, you know, rejected these kind of assumptions. I think that's a great opportunity 
to expand, you know, the 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 pool of people, the folks at the table talking about um, a willingness to to embrace a greater role for the government in addressing our, our public interest priorities. And the other thing that I've noticed in this is that MMT is not really designed for the corporations. You know, the MMT should be for the public. Yeah. It's not. V very true. I want to add something to this. I don't want to say but. I just want to add to this. <clears throat> but if a business owner really understood MMT, it benefits a business owner if the public has money and less credits and debts, okay? <laughs> if people are not weighed down with credit card debts, student loan debts, mortgage debts, then they have more money to like spend on ice cream, clothes, I don't know, going fishing, going on a vacation. So, I don't think that MMT or the notion of protecting the public interest has to necessarily be viewed as antithetical to being, you know, anti beneficial to those in the private sector, right? I'm trying to frame that, you know, in a way because because if the public has more money, they're free. They have more economic freedom, more financial freedom. You know, they're not weighed down with health care uh, expenses and, you know, uh, well, then they have more disposable income to enjoy life. Like, what I like about MMT is that it enables, it en it enables us to engage in a kind of imaginative envisioning of the world. I mean, imagine a world. We have this micro documentary on our campaign website. Once again, that web address is ourmoneyus.org. But we have a micro documentary on the website where we ask people to envision a world, right? Envision a world where rather than working five days a week, eight to 10 hours a day until you're 77 or 72. I mean, imagine a world where people work, I don't know, two or three days a week, maybe four to five, hours a day on those days, right? I think I read something that said that, you know, you know, people work twice as, twice as much now than they did in the 15th century, where people maybe worked six months out of the year, and then during the months when they did work, you know, they maybe worked two or three hours, two or three days a week, right? Like, I envision people having a better quality of life, guys. You know, it breaks my heart when I go to Walmart or 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 restaurants where where people are working at 75, you know, for minimum wage and doing so not because they want to, because they just, you know, want to stay active, but doing so because they have to. That breaks my heart. Like, why should we have that kind of society where people have that kind of quality of life? Where, where, where your grandmother and great-grandmother, great-grandfather has to literally work till they're 80 on jobs where they're barely getting paid when they should be at home enjoying the horizon of their life. So I think that MMT provides the opportunity for us to really see more beneficiaries in the system there's more of us who have a stake. I think there's a way to think about an MMT informed economy that is not, that, that is, that can provide growth to businesses as well. So I just wanted to accent that, you know, I mean, the financial sector, I mean, um, maybe it's good for the financial sector if homes aren't being foreclosed on, you know, I don't know. I mean, maybe there's, you know, there's a, there's a way in which I mean, yes, the financial sector will not be able to reap and extract, it's kind of rent extraction from just the ability to create money out of nothing. 
maybe the financial sector would benefit if, you know, um, the public and businesses have more deposits and they're doing more businesses, doing what people think banks do, which is, you know, managing deposits and not manufacturing money out of nothing. I don't know, but I think for the majority of society, it's possible for us to envision an economy that benefits the public as really benefiting more stakeholders in society. Than we do. Well said. I think uh, so much of, of your work and, and the work that we're trying to do as a progressive economic community now, building these coalitions of uh, various tribes of solidarity is, is really transforming the, the social imagination around money and economics. And, and that takes a lot of work and just, you know, again, so inspired by what you're doing. I think it's just so important. And uh, we really appreciate you being on Growing Down podcasts with us to talk about all of this. Um, Dr. Coates, how, how do people find you? Um, you want to mention that website one more time and, and how they connect with you? Right. For the third time, our website is, uh, it's the Our Money campaign. Our website is OurMoneyUS.org. People can go there. They can sign up. And that way you can stay updated about what we're doing. Also, you can follow Our Money on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Um, Our, Money, or, or Our Money US on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. My personal Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter is I am Delman Coates. People can kind of stay connected with, you know, more what I'm doing on the religion, on like the church side and more the economic side. You know, I just want to close um, 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 by reflecting on something Dr. King said in the aftermath of the unrest of the 60s. Um, he said, if a, he's quoting Victor Hugo. And he said, if a soul lives in darkness, sins will be committed. But the guilty one is not the one who commits the sins, but the one who causes the darkness. And I think that what we've been talking about today and what I'm deeply passionate about is how we, um, how we get at and how we address the cause of the social and economic and spiritual darkness that we see in the world today. I wanna to commend uh, growing down, I want to commend all of the progressives listening and those um, people who are listening right now. Perhaps you're not involved in an organization. I want to encourage you to get involved because that's the only way we're going to make our world a better place and to make our economy more sustainable and a more peaceful world. So thank, thanks, thank you guys for having me on today. And I look forward to further partnership and collaboration. Awesome. Amen. Thank you. So Thank, much. You. Thank you. Thank you. That was amazing. Thank you.